Hi, my name is Jay Sanford and I do Sport and Exercise Sciences and for my third year dissertation project I have done a service evaluation of the Sandwell and West Birmingham Hospitals Trust Phase 3 Cardiovascular Rehabilitation Programme that is offered at City Hospital in Birmingham. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in the United Kingdom and cardiac rehabilitation is put into place as a secondary prevention with the aims of restoring patients' health and from their disease condition and also ensuring that the quality of life is brought back to what it was previously. So the aim of this study was to basically see if the cardiac rehabilitation programme they offer at City Hospital was effective and see whether there are any differences between sex, ethnicity and also the intervention of the patients. We had 94 patients in total. All of them uh, were referred to the outpatients for cardiac rehabilitation at City Hospital and they all underwent assessments before they started their exercise training sessions. These assessments were anthropometric, so we measured age, weight, height and body mass index. We also did some cardiovascular assessments which included resting heart rate, resting blood pressure, heart rate maximum during exercise and then heart rate recovery and blood pressure recovery at one minute and five minutes post-exercise. Um, exercise capacity was determined by an incremental shuttle walk test. Patients had to complete 24 exercise training sessions and then we did follow-up measures. What we found was there was a significant increase in the number of shuttles which patients completed after cardiac rehab. There was also a significant increase in heart rate recovery at one minute and five minutes post-exercise. There was no difference in anthropometric measures um, at follow-up and there was also no difference in blood pressure at follow-up either. These findings um, are quite encouraging. We're showing that um, patients can walk further after cardiac rehabilitation um, and also that they have a greater reduction in heart rate after exercise, which is really good. Um, we can use these findings as well uh, for best practice in the development of cardiovascular rehabilitation at City Hospital Birmingham. Uh, hi, my name is Alex, and for my third year dissertation as part of my sports and exercise degree, I uh, looked at um, matching energy intake to energy expenditure during different intensity exercise bouts. So basically, we got people to do a VO2 max test so they run as hard as they can, so we can work out their fitness levels, and then we get them to run at 60% or 90% of their VO2 max. Both energy bouts um, were expended the exact same amount of energy, 450 calories. Um, from there, we asked them to consume food to um, so the same amount of what they thought they'd expended and give us an estimation of what they'd expended. Um, so we found that actually a lower intensity, moderate intensity, causes people to, first of all, think they've expended less energy and consume less energy compared to higher intensities. This has implications on people trying to lose weight. So if they choose a moderate intensity exercise bout, it might actually cause a greater weight loss compared to higher intensities. My name is Simon Franklin and I was looking at the effect of footwear on foot strike in middle and long distance runners. Basically we got runners into the lab and focused on kinematics associated between barefoot running and running in shoes. We used our motion capture system where we have over in the kinesiology lab to focus on differences in technique and style associated between running in barefoot and running in shoes. The results we found from this were that middle distance runners, as they're used to running more quickly and with more forefoot strike, which is associated with barefoot running, that there was very little difference between running in barefoot and running in shoes. Whereas in longer distance runners, they normally adopt a rear foot strike and therefore running in barefoot changes this and there's significant differences between the two conditions. Therefore, this has implications on the recommendations for middle distance and long distance runners. As, as there's no little difference between barefoot and shod and middle distance runners, the benefits which they'll get from doing barefoot will be very limited. Whereas for long distance runners, if they switch to running barefoot, this may alter their kinematics so they can be beneficial for their performance. My name is Laura Bowen and I'm currently in my third year studying sport and exercise sciences. My project was looking at how maximal and dynamic strength predict sprint, shuttle and jump performance in young elite footballers at Aston Villa Academy. 
It was based on a previous study which looked at maximal strength and sprint and jump variables in adult elite footballers. We tested 12 players, they did their one rep and the three rep max deadlifts, they did two 10 metre sprints, two 10 metre shuttles and three counter movement jumps. Um, we didn't find any relationship in the results for the one rep max or the three rep max predicting sprint, shuttle or jump. Um, this could have been due to the fact that the players had never had any strength training before so they didn't know how to maximally produce force. Um, it could also could be due to the fact that they all had different maturity levels so um, it might have affected their functional capacity. Um, what we did find was maximal and dynamic strength were strongly related to one another but the sprint and shuttle were only moderately related and the jump didn't predict either sprint or shuttle. This suggests that we picked the wrong test to test sprint and jump and that also sprint and jump can't be grouped together in young elite footballers. In future what we're going to do is we're going to use this dissertation as a baseline um, do a strength training intervention for a number of weeks and then test them again to then see if the relationship exists. Okay, my name is Scott Powell, I'm a third year sport and exercise science pupil. Um, I've recently finished my third year dissertation project which was looking at coaches and athletes motivation in a grassroots football setting. Um, what we specifically wanted to look at was um, the antecedents of coaches specific styles, so whether they use controlling styles or autonomy supportive styles. Um, autonomy supportive styles are where you're offering your athletes choice and provision and this is very adaptive whereas controlling behaviours is where you're, at, you're giving your athletes rewards or you may be threatening them which is obviously maladaptive to get their athletes motivation. So we used the questionnaire which measured um, a lot of variables for the coaches motivational climate um, and we specifically found that the coach's basic psychological needs was um, associated with their autonomy supportive uh, style. So therefore you can conclude that the club environment should sort of create an environment where these needs can be satisfied and therefore your coach is more likely to use more adaptive coaching styles such as autonomy supportive. Um, I also investigated whether the perceived pressures in the environment had any effect on their coach's style. Um, we found no significant results in this area, but this may be because we looked at a grassroots sample. Future research may um, look in sort of a more competitive area of sport, so sort of academy performance where there is high pressure and we we'll see whether this affects the coaching um, styles of those coaches.